thought boundaries. This is the Free Your Mind Show with Moose Girl and Grimner. Sit back and listen and see your way beyond the world as it has been defined. We have a ponder gander with Vinny to think and reason, raising expectations through thought-provoking episodes. If you cannot do great things, do small things in a great way. On Sundays, you can sit back and relax and enjoy some music from Grimner. He broadcasts the Sunday Blues Show live on Sundays from noon to 3 p.m. Eastern Time. He plays all kinds of blues, from great oldies like Robert Johnson, Howlin' Wolf, and John Lee Hooker, to the most modern hard-rocking blues from Joe Bonamassa, Poppy Chubby, and Samantha Fish, and all of the stuff between, like Stevie Ray Vaughan, Jack Bach Project, and Gary Moore. He also plays blues music from classic rock bands, the Rolling Stones, ZZ Top, and Cream. And while he's playing the music, we are in the Real Liberty Media chat on irc.freenode.net playing a rousing. So come on over and join us every Sunday for some great tunes, fun trivia, and great chat. We also have a show, The Top Ten Countdown. Gary L. and Gigi's Boo play the top ten songs from years gone by and they provide some interesting historical facts and trivia about the songs and the era. These are all great shows with great content and inspiring messages. Come spend some time with us. Get to know us, and we will get to know you. Also, if you love what you hear and want to represent, we have Real Liberty Media gear. You will love the artwork, and it will inspire conversation. Check out our Amazon.com store and Real Liberty Media goods from our website. RealLibertyMedia.com. Hey, hello there. This is Doc Mike, the Redneck Dennis. Nice to be with you guys again today. Hopefully everything's coming through fine. It looks like it is. Uh, I wanted to take a minute to um, mention uh, Free Your Mind with Grimner and Moose Girl. What a great show they had this week. If you guys haven't checked out other shows on Real Liberty Media, you really should go check them out. There's some great thinkers on there. It's really fantastic. I really enjoyed listening to Moose Girl and Grimner because they come at topics from slightly different angles and they kind of cover everything. So uh, be sure and check them out. Uh, Let's see, had an interesting week this week. I'm going to talk a little bit about an injury I sustained. And the reason I'm going to do that, almost as a public service announcement, because, uh, you know, once in a while we got to do something, I think. Hopefully, I do something good and encourage people to take care of themselves in one way or another. I'm going to briefly describe this injury. I won't get into too many gory details, but a little bit. So if you're timid, you might not want to listen for a few minutes. Um, This comes under the category of both uh, the redneck moment of the week and all bleeding eventually stops. So the redneck moment was my, I have a dog, I, I have three dogs, but one of them is kind of a big dog. He's a mix between a pit and some other things. I think Weimaraner or something else. Just the sweetest dog in the world. Really good dog. And he's laying on his bed right here next to me. He's probably seven or eight years old, something like that. His name is Bear. Anyway, he likes laying right in front of the heater. I have a propane heater here in the man cave. And in the morning when I turn the heat on, uh, after 30 minutes or so, he starts panting. So I pull his bed away from the heater, give him a little breathing room, I guess. Like he's not smart enough to get up and move himself, I guess. But anyway, so I have this love seat recliner combination Uh, So my wife and I can sit and watch TV or whatever, uh, maybe a couple nights a week. And um, the back of that thing is not up against the wall. It's sitting in the middle of the room. And 
I had never noticed this little defect that got me, but uh, so Bear's laying on his bed. I had just got out of the hot tub. My wife was still in the hot tub, and it's outside on the back deck so we can overlook the valley. It's really nice. I'm really blessed. Anyway, um, so I came in, and Bear was panting, of course, so instead of you know, having Bear get up out of his bed and then move in the bed, I grabbed hold of the bed with Bear on it and dragged it toward that recliner. Well, the back of the recliner had been pulled out. And by that, I mean this strip of, well, let me just call it hellacious metal. <laughs> that holds the upholstery to the wooden frame had been bent away from the back. And as I dragged that bed back, this dagger-like uh, protrusion from that metal strip stuck into my arm, my forearm just below the elbow, and it sliced me open so cleanly that honestly for a second I I didn't I couldn't really figure out what it was or what had happened but in that one split second I'm sure you guys have experienced some kind of trauma before there's kind of a split second where you don't really know what happened and then realization hits that something really bad happened. Well, so in that split second when I realized something really bad happened, I, of course, let go of the dog bed, and I grabbed my forearm with my other hand. Now, this cut happened in a place I couldn't see it. It's on the opposite side of my arm that, you know, if you rotate it really hard, I guess, you'd be able to see it, but I wasn't, I can tell you this, I wasn't interested in trying to see how bad I was hurt, because I knew how bad I was hurt, and this is, <laughs> this is the gory part, okay, I guess. Um, when I grabbed my arm, not, the first thing I noticed is that my fingers actually went in my arm, and I could feel that sinewy um, coating that covers your muscles and kind of just above that I could feel blood vessels trying to pump so I did not release pressure at all from the second I grabbed my arm I knew that I had to hold that pressure on and the reason I'm telling this story is so that everybody walks away with this thought. Yes, all bleeding eventually stops. That can either be kind of involuntary where you just bleed out, or it can be voluntary where you actually control the bleeding. And direct pressure is the absolute best way of stopping bleeding. Now, I wasn't about to deal with this thing by myself. It's about um, maybe four inches long, and it, it's like it was like gutting a fish. Honestly, it just like slit me open. It was fast. It, it was clean. It didn't hurt. I can't say that I felt any pain whatsoever. It was such a sharp piece of metal. If you've ever experienced that, you know what I'm saying. So I held pressure on that wound. I went through the house all the way to the back and I, Rochelle was still in the hot tub and I just told her I need help. And she, you know, of course was confused because I had just left the hot tub and I was all fine. And then, um, and then, uh, I said again, I need help kind of more enthusiastically and she could see I was holding my arm. And there was some blood on my hand. I'm going to get to that in a minute. Of course, there was blood on my hand. But so she came in the house. She got some gauze. She, we have bandages, you know, ace bandages or wraps, whatever you want to call it. And she, you know, 
we were standing near each other, and she was asking me what happened. I said, listen, I go, I'll tell you in a minute. I said, when I pull my fingers away from this, I said, I want you to spend time looking at it because I'm bleeding bad. So I said, just shove the gauze on it. I'll hold the gauze, and you wrap it up. And so, you know, we got prepared, and I said, okay, let's let's do this. Or she said, okay, let's do this. I pulled my fingers away. She put the gauze on. We wrapped it up. So neither one of us had still even seen what this looks like. So, you know, got gauze on there, a lot of gauze, got a good wrap on it, kind of tight, not too tight, didn't have to be a tourniquet, just needed some pressure constantly on it. And went, to, you know, we went and jumped in the car and headed to the ER, which is like 15 miles away because we live in the country, no big deal. And it was kind of funny. I don't know if this is an age thing or not. Um, it, this is kind of one of my philosophies, I guess. And that is, if you live long enough, you get hurt enough times doing whatever, just living life, that you have other pain to compare pain to. And so <laughs> we're heading to the ER and I'm not kidding about this. I was kind of laughing with my wife, like, you know, this is so crazy. I said, I know that I'm hurt significantly, and and it doesn't really even hurt. And it's just funny. We're both just going about our mornings. So I'll give you a little background. So the grandkids and the kids took off for Southern California well, they went to Yosemite, and then they went back up to Northern California to help their dad. I'm stepdad, you know. Um, nobody ever refers to me like that. It's just, you know, dad or papa or whatever. But um, So they were gone all week, and here we had, you know, time to just kind of hang out together, kind of nice, quiet, peaceful time, and we were soaking up the 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 morning in the hot tub and then here we are off to the, off to the ER and I was just kind of laughing about how life comes at you and how things can change so fast and so we get to the hospital okay so the lesson here is listen and I'm going to give you one more example and then I'll go back to the ER so I worked in a correctional facility before some of you know I was a dentist in the Federal Bureau of Prisons and, um, you know, stuff happens there, too. And one time an inmate had been stabbed, slashed, and he had a neck wound. And the um, medical staff, well, of course, correctional staff and medical staff had brought, the, uh, had brought that patient into the medical facility. And I see this physician's assistant, foreign medical grad, and... She's putting like some gauze on this wound on this guy's neck and then uh, for about four seconds and then like pulling it off to look and see. And as she came in the door, I said, hey, put that gauze on there, put some pressure on it and do not remove it because it was a significant wound. Um, he did survive. It wasn't like his throat was slit, but he did have a neck wound that was bleeding pretty significantly, and I believe it was juggler vein too. But it doesn't matter. My point is, and I'll give you one more example that's really crazy as hell, and you probably won't believe it. But anyway, so keep direct pressure on a significant wound to stop the bleeding, and don't let it off to go check on it. Just keep the pressure on. You will stop the bleeding. It might take a few minutes, maybe seven minutes, maybe 10, maybe 20. Just keep the pressure on because when you let it off and let that thing bleed, you're kind of starting all over again. So that's my kind of lesson of the day as far as this little story goes. There is a story of a kid who was working on farm equipment. This had to have been 30 years ago because... I distinctly remember, and I believe it was here in Oregon, but it could have been some other state. 
But this kid, maybe 15, 16, 17 years old, he was out and working farm equipment, and something happened to the PTO, and he went back to see what happened, and he, and his arms got caught up in the PTO, and both hit, listen to this, this is crazy, both his arms were torn off. Somehow this kid walked from the tractor all the way to the to his house. It was a mile or a mile and a half, and he didn't bleed out. I'm sure there's some unique circumstances to why he didn't bleed out. He lost both his arms, by the way, and he lived to tell the story. So, you know, some wounds are not survivable, obviously, but some are, a lot are. Like, you're going to survive everything but one thing in your life, right? <laughs> so, as far as bleeding goes, remember, all bleeding eventually stops. You don't have to let it do it on its own. <laughs> you can help stop it. So, anyway, I'll tell you the rest of the story here. When I went to the ER, you know that you did something significant when the trauma doc, well, the trauma uh nurse looks at it and goes oh yeah you really opened yourself up there and then the nurse that's assigned to you looks at it later an hour later and says oh yeah you really opened yourself up and then the doc when he finally gets to see it because I was so calm I'm sure people were thinking oh I had a little cut and then when he saw it he goes oh and luckily he, he knew I was a dentist I gave him a fair warning ahead of time <laughs> He says, oh, Doc, he says, uh, yeah, you really opened yourself up there. And it's going to take some stitches. Of course, I knew that. But, uh, hey, the bleeding was stopped. I'm fine. You know, I probably have a little pain today because of, you know, swelling that comes after you injured yourself and a little bit of inflammation. But really, everything is fine. Uh, really happy. I don't have any nerve damage. It was my right hand. I'm a dentist. That could have been complicated, to say the least. But uh, totally uh, opened my arm up right down to the muscle. Uh, you can actually see the muscle. The ER staff was nice enough to give me some, take some pictures for me for posterity's sake, I guess. And... Um, it didn't actually get the muscle, which was awesome, but uh, took every bit of my covering opened up. So, anyway, keep that in mind in the future. If you ever have a bleeding incident, just firm, constant pressure. And at one point, you know, I was kind of thinking maybe I should relieve the pressure on the wound, when, like when we were driving to town, because my fingers were a little bit cold, but... It could have been because I lost some blood. It could have been because, you know, I was probably a little shocky no matter what. Uh, it could have been that the bandage was a little tight. But I can tell you, oh, yeah, the ER doc said I did I, I did the right thing. He goes, you, you did absolutely what you were supposed to do. And he said, yeah, you cut some arterioles and some veins. And, you know, you got everything in that upper layer of, tissue above your muscles so yeah it was beautiful it was probably the worst laceration I've ever had that's for sure so keep that in mind stay safe <laughs> be careful I don't know how I don't know how I didn't ever notice that on that sofa before but of course as soon as I got home we fixed that right up so uh it is sort of a temporary fix now. I mean, it's put back together the way it was intended to be, but this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to take that strip off uh, again, and I am going to glue that thing down <laughs> and then nail it back in place, and um, that should take care of that. Because, man, you know how your brain starts doing stuff after an incident like this? Like, I started thinking, man, if that would have happened to my wife, if if she would have been, like, I don't know, 
you know, vacuuming or picking up stuff or whatever in the man cave, and she would have walked by that and caught her leg on it, it would have slit her wide open, and maybe there wouldn't have been anybody here. She would have been on her own. She would have survived anyway. But I'm just saying, you know, and then I started thinking about the dog. You know, that thing was just at the right height that um, it, it, you know, it could have got him. You know, he's tall enough. He could have brushed up against that thing. I mean, dogs may be smarter than humans. <laughs> like, as soon as he felt something, he probably would have moved away. And um, it just so happened that the motion I made was one smooth pull. And that thing entered my skin so easily like I said, it just zipped me right open, like no problem at all. All right, that's it for the redneck moment of the week and my all bleeding eventually stops segment. Of course, um, I like to use that all bleeding eventually stops uh, as a philosophy of life in general when I see things going on in the world that is kind of like just slowly bleeding us out. Um, man, I was just thinking about Grimner and Moose Girl's show yesterday. So, so this is what they. Uh, this was the t title of their show: is you can check out anytime you like, but you can never leave. And I'm telling you, it was such a great job. And I was just thinking about how that relates to all bleeding eventually stops. Kind of, they covered that. <laughs> they covered that uh, pretty well in their show without even knowing it but uh, really uh, good topic. Okay, so I have some things to talk about today. Um, I'm going to talk about Microsoft and Linux a little bit, and I know like for a lot of people who listen to this show, listen to Real Liberty Media, I'm preaching to the choir. But I'm going to give you a little bit of history. Uh, in 1999, I started using Linux. Now, I am not a power user of any sort. I still kind of stumble around trying to find thing, the way to do some things in Linux. But for the most part, I can use Linux just fine for everyday stuff and never have a problem with it. I started using Linux in 1999, and I think the first version I used was Red Hat Linux. And... The reason I started using it is because in 1999, everybody was talking about how when the year changed to 2000, computers would become stupid because they're going to think it's 1900 instead of 2000. And that all kinds of hell was going to happen when the, when the clock rolls over on New Year's Eve of 1999. Now, like so many other, you know, catastrophes that supposedly are heading our way or were heading our way. I mean, how long did the Mayan calendar thing last? Um, it lasted forever. I mean, there were some really good arguments about the Mayan calendar, you know, and uh, I, don't, I can't remember. I think it was 2012 or whatever. Uh, and then, of course, if you go back, uh, well, I wouldn't say before we knew about the Mayan calendar, but back in the late uh, early 70s and mid 70s I, I remember distinctly I was a teenager um, young teenager then and I remember us talking about the the coming ice age and how you know we had to prepare and do everything we could for the coming ice age ice age but luckily we fended that off with um, global warming I guess so now global warming, or now I guess it's just climate change in general is going to destroy the earth. Anyway, my point is there's always something coming that's going to wipe us all out, and it always comes and goes, and we're still here. So, yeah, maybe someday something will, um, but, uh, but it wasn't the time change of New Year's Eve 1999, but... The good thing that came out of that is, uh, and I w I've always been kind of a computer geek, so I, um, you know, had built my own computers. I'd, I've always wanted to know how computers work, so I've always kind of 
learned to program, learned what kind of languages computer use, and try and get them to do what I want them to do instead of what somebody else thinks I should let them do. Kind of like life in general, I think. Uh, the older I get, the more I realize um, others don't make very good decisions for me. I think I should be the one who makes decisions for myself and some of my family too. Um, but we're all able to make decisions for ourselves. So anyway, I started using Linux in 1999. And at that time, okay, so that was probably Windows 95, maybe 97-ish. And, um, and of course, I think Windows 2000 came out probably shortly before or after 2000. I can't remember. But the, the my point is, you know, if you ran Windows at that time, if you were around at that time, you were familiar with this acronym, BSOD, the Blue Screen of Death, because Microsoft was, let's say, well known for BSOD, the Blue Screen of Death, when you're just working away, doing something, and all of a sudden the computer locks up, and you get the BSOD, which means you have to reboot your computer and hope to God everything starts back up and everything is going to be fine. Um, but the bottom line is you had to stop and reboot your computer or shut down your computer. Sometimes you had to hard shut down your computer because it was so locked up that the Control-Alt-Delete salute didn't work. So you'd have to either turn the power off or literally unplug it from the wall and wait minutes for the memories to clear out before you could plug it back in and reboot and get back to what you were doing. Well, in 1999, when I fired up that Linux computer, um, just as a test, I wanted to see how long that thing would run without ever giving me a BSOD or giving me any reason to reboot it. And you know what? For one solid year, that computer never went offline. Now, luckily, in that one solid year, I never had any power outage either. So I was able to really compare Windows to Linux. And the beauty was I could do everything I wanted to do on my Linux machine that I did on a Windows machine. At that time, I think I was playing an online game, so probably on the Windows computer I would play that online game because games don't, I shouldn't say games don't play real well on Linux. There are a lot of games you can play on Linux, um, but a lot of the great games that are out there, if you're a gamer, uh, they don't play on Linux. You pretty much have to play them on Windows, which brings me to the current problem. <laughs> so last year during COVID, okay, I had a computer that probably I had been running uh, Linux on for 15 years. And I mean, that computer was old and I was kind of looking to upgrade because it had been a long time since I had a nice computer and upgraded it. So I decided I was going to build a really nice computer and and explore the gaming world. Well, so I put a really good graphics card, a really good motherboard, a really good processor, you know, kind of a lot of power, a lot of air, cooling, room, a big tower. You know, I kind of didn't spare any expense building this system. And then, of course, I had to put windows on part of it so that I could go explore the kind of PC gaming world. Drink time, hold up. Hmm. So, you know, it had been a long time since I had played with Windows other than in the work environment, which I don't know why businesses use Windows and pay for those licenses fees and the protection um, it's just got to be that number one they don't have any idea and number two everybody tells them that's what they should do because you know for my 
family and my kids who are contractors, I've been telling them, you guys need to figure out how to do your business on Linux so you can get rid of that Microsoft software and that Microsoft update and that Microsoft, uh, you know, help support or whatever. And just, you know, every few years they're discontinuing continuing support for their older versions. So then you're forced to buy the newer versions and you're forced to pay, you know, when you don't have to. If you're running a business, especially a small business, come on. Cut expenses, man, and make your life safe and secure with a Linux operating system. And I was just looking today at all the different, let's say, flavors of Linux. There's a Ubuntu Studio that if you're doing um, videos or editing videos or music or sound files, uh, even artwork, uh, there's a there's a there's a distribution that's kind of dedicated to. Um, well, studio work. <laughs> I was going to say art, arts and artistic stuff, but all of it. Um, there are some versions that are much more kind of business class. But And I haven't tried them all. I've, I've heard some recommendations here on Real Liberty Media about trying out some different versions. Grimner is a good guy to go to for that. So I'm going to try out one version that he talks about. And um, just explore. The fun thing is, you know, it's free. It doesn't cost me anything, so I can explore all these different flavors. And actually, uh, Linux is so nice, too, because you can make it look however you want it to look. For people who are coming from the Windows environment, there's actually some themes that are Windows-based themes, <laughs> which I think is kind of funny. Um, but on my Windows setup, I have Ubuntu's, Ubuntu screensaver and background on my screens because I hate Windows so much. But anyway, man, I get I get so distracted so easily. It's just like there's something sparkly over there, and off I go. But uh, but um, I wanted to get back to this my current situation. So about a, okay, so I built this system. I put Windows on because I like playing. I like playing games. It's, I've only started getting into playing games on a computer, video games, in the last, uh, I guess, year, I think. And I started with a PS4 console, PlayStation 4 console, and it, and it was really nice. But, you know, as I was playing, people would say, oh, you got to see, you got to play this game on PC and see what it looks like. The graphics are so much better. So I built this system. I put Windows on it. I have a I have a Linux sector, so I have a dual boot system, so I can boot up in Linux when I want to be serious, and I can boot up to Windows when I want to play the game. One game specifically, uh, Elder Scrolls Online is what it's called. Uh, it's a really fun game. The graphics are beautiful. It's a great experience. My system just it's a fantastic video game experience if you're into video games. So, like somewhere around Monday, I think, <laughs> of last week, uh, I come into the man cave and I try to fire up, oh, uh, voice meter, and it doesn't want to start. It just starts, kind of shows me a screen for about three seconds, and it goes away. So I'm like, oh, that's kind of weird. So I'll try, um, I'll try, uh, I'll try LibreOffice. So I fire up LibreOffice thinking, you know, that's pretty benign. And it fires up and it starts looking like it's going to load files and show me the home screen. And no, it shuts down. I was like, oh, this is kind of weird. Well, I'll fire up IRC so I can start, you know, asking people what they know about this and find some help. And, um, IRC wouldn't fire up. It would start up and it would just kind of sit there for a minute and it would and it would <laughs> shut down. Okay, so here's where it gets really awesome. So I was like, okay, I don't really know about solving problems on Windows, but I should have been a little more 
Um, I should have paid a little more attention about what I was doing on Windows so I would know how to fix this situation. But maybe my computer just needs a reboot. So I reboot. You know, and that takes like three minutes, I don't know, four minutes, five minutes. Uh, and I did see in uh, the chat room just now, right now on IRC, they mentioned Steam powered. Uh, and that's true. And that and those games are pretty fun too. So you can run Steam on Linux and play some games there, and that's awesome. Anyway, so I reboot the computer. You know, log in, computer starts up. I start playing, you know, with the same programs, trying to get them to fire up. Nothing. So I reboot again and again. And I went through a complete shutdown, walked away for five, ten minutes, came back, start up the machine from cold or lukewarm. Probably one time everything started working, and I thought, okay, I got to get some stuff done really quick. So I did a couple things really quickly, and then um, I don't know why. I decided I needed to reboot it, but I did, and of course, everything quit working again. Now, one thing I do have on this computer, I have a, I have a video card that gives me the option to shut down some of Windows services when I'm playing games so the Windows doesn't interrupt those games. So when I turn on the boost on the video card, it kind of shuts Windows down so it can't really screw with anything. Well, I noticed if I hit the boost on that video card, it shuts down the services and uh, it adjusts like, uh, it kind of tracks the CPU temperature and it monitors my, uh, my RAM. Um, but the main thing is, uh, it kind of limits Windows interference. Well, when I shut that down, then I noticed that voice meter would work. So finally, I could have sound again. And then and then I would try and launch some of the other programs, and they still wouldn't work. So like IRC wouldn't work, um, but wouldn't work, uh, LibreOffice wouldn't work, um, Discord wouldn't work. I mean, there were a bunch of these programs that wouldn't work. So anyway, I, once I kind of got home for the day, because of course I had to go to work and all that, and that was the first thing I was doing in the morning, and I was screwed, I was kind of screwed with it for two hours, and I go to work, and you know, I'm one of these OCD guys, like I can't let something go, so in my brain, I'm kind of working it over, and, and at work, I'm kind of researching stuff on the internet in between patients like what the heck is going wrong with this computer and then I had a bunch of ideas to try anyway um, so for a couple nights <laughs> I I kept fighting this stupid bug and I think one of the things was and I'm not saying that that part of my system is fixed as a matter of fact I'm fairly certain it's not but once I got everything where it's working again, I just finally decided I'm not going to turn it off until I kind of get it uh, debugged by someone other than myself. And yeah, that probably means I'm going to be talking to Microsoft and see if they can give me some help or some tips or whatever. And um, anyway, so once I got it started up, I was just like, I'm just going to leave it running until I get my show done this week. <laughs> and, then, and then I'm going to shut it down and that's why like I have everything set up on Linux but I was kind of I wanted I want to get this part of the system fixed before I shut it down so I'm leaving it up so I can call Microsoft and have them help me out um, but anyway my point is you don't have that kind of problem on Linux at least I have never had that kind of problem on Linux I know there's a bunch of technical talk and some stuff about how the system is set up and how the programs all work together or whatever that keeps the entire system from crashing. 
And the other thing is, Linux doesn't just you know go and update your computer whenever it wants to update your computer. And I notice Microsoft has some options, but pretty much they want to update well whenever they want to update. And I can tell you one of the things that probably caused such a problem on my system. <laughs> Excuse me. Is whenever uh, I hit that boost on my video card and it shuts off the Windows, uh, whatever it's called, Windows services, one of the services I'm sure that was going on at the time, and I know this because later it eventually did an update, is it was probably trying to download its update, and that's one of the things that this that this little piece of software does is it shuts Windows update down so it won't interfere while you're playing a game I guess so anyway uh, so it probably took a couple days because after I hit that boost I wouldn't unboost it and then Windows would have to pick up again whenever I don't know whenever the boost wasn't on but um, I just wanted to kind of tell everybody, man, if you haven't used Linux, you can actually even put Linux on a thumb drive, as a matter of fact, and stick it in your Windows computer, and it'll ask you, do you want to try it out? Like, do you want to try Linux out? Like, just try it on your Windows computer, and you can say yes, and you can play around with it while it's on the thumb drive, and... Then you, when you're done, you can just quit and take it out. And I think that's a great way to kind of uh, introduce yourself to Linux because you're not going to lose your Windows system. You're going to, you know, you'll still have Windows there, but you'll just be able to play around with Linux. And when you're done, you're done. You know, you can kind of start learning it a little bit at a time without going through an install and having a dual boot or hopefully getting rid of Windows altogether and just having a Linux machine. <laughs> but um, but you so you can try it out, and it's really simple to do. I think you just download the ISO on a thumb drive. ISO is, I don't know, some kind of term for an image, uh, something image file, a disk image or something like that, and you just plug it in, and, and it, your little prompt will come up. Hey, would you like to install Linux or would you like to run Linux and you can do it and you can do it with or without network support and I think that's a really great way to try Linux out and see how it will work for you now of course that limited version um, doesn't have everything that Linux can do on it but it has everything that you'll probably want to do it probably has an office program it has a browser it has an email program if you want to go to Facebook or Instagram or Twitter, or whatever any of those other awful freaking censoring programs are, you can go check those out and just get used to where everything is and then go back to your Windows computer when you've had enough until you get to the point where, hey, I could use Linux every day in my life. And uh, I'll tell you something else about Linux. There's a couple of really cool things about Linux. One is... If you're smart and you don't log in as root, which means like administrator, but once you have your administrator account, you create a different user for yourself and then log in as that user, um, you can really protect your system from ever being totally hacked. Uh, that's one of the great things about Linux is it kind of protects the, the main brain of the system so it's much harder to hack than a Windows computer. There was something else along that line I was going to say. So hacking is one thing, and uh, I forgot. Uh, yeah, I can't remember. Uh, but it is kind of cool just to, oh, I know the other thing. There is actually a file system that you can use when you build your Linux uh, system. And when you install your Linux operating system, there's actually a file system you can use that I have heard. I haven't tried it out myself. I think I did try it out before. But you could actually be typing on a document. 
Like literally you're typing away on a document and the, and the power goes out or somebody pulls the plug on your machine. When you reboot the machine, your computer will be, will come back up at the very spot you were typing. Like it won't lose the work that you were working on. And I forget if that's EXTF or something like that or EX. I don't know what I, I don't remember what the file system is, but that's pretty awesome, especially for people that are doing kind of critical work, uh, um, you know, where you can't afford to retype a document or whatever. I mean, it's a yeah, ext4 now it's called. Grimner just put in the IRC. Um, yeah, that's an incredible file system. Uh, uh, you know, for people who need that kind of stuff. I don't think I'm ever, you know, in the middle of something so critical that I can't get it back, you know. But, I mean, but it is nice to have that file system where you don't lose, you know, work that you've done. So, those are my big, uh, my big things of the week. Oh, there was one other thing. Somebody was in... Uh, on IRC last night, I swear to God, this is where I uh, that, that's where I saw this story, and I couldn't find it today. But somebody posted, and I hope it's a joke, but it just probably isn't. Somebody posted that Bill Gates and George Soros are going to be like they're going to create a group of people who just who do the policing on fake news and harmful conversations or harmful posts on uh, public media like Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, whatever else is out there. And I started to find that because there's been a time, there was a time, I think it was around 2000 actually, when there was some talk of, of, somebody, probably Gates or somebody like Gates, wanting to make Linux basically outlawed because they were saying that only hackers use Linux, you know, and they were trying to make it like a, <laughs> kind of make us Linux users like a terrorist organization. And um, man, if Soros and Gates are in charge of what's fair and what's not fair, fair you can pretty much bet he's going to try and outlaw anything that competes with Microsoft products. Um, so we got that to look forward to. Although I think, of course, I, I don't know anymore. I, I was going to say I think the Linux community wouldn't tolerate it. But hell, I mean, if you look at the world today, we, we I'll say we, we're all so willing to be locked down and to follow these stupid uh you know, recommendations by the morons who think they're in charge anyway. So, I don't know. I would hope that the uh, people who love Linux would, well, I don't know what we would do, but somehow we would have to pre prevent from becoming a terrorist organization. I guess it doesn't matter. It would just be the next terrorist organization I'd be a member of, right? Um, <laughs> not. I'm not saying... I'm not saying, in case any of my employers or whatever are listening, I'm not saying I'm voluntarily a member of a terrorist organization. I'm just saying, you know, people keep redefining those boundaries, and I probably fall into one or two of them, and that would be another one. Okay, so hopefully that doesn't happen, but, and I wish, yeah, I wish, I could find that article again. Maybe I'll find it before next week, but who knows? Uh, it may pop up in the IRC or not. And if you are listening to this show or you visit Real Liberty Media, be sure and check on the chat box and join us in chat. We really do, you know, love having exchanges with people there. So, and you probably, you know, have really good exchanges with people. Uh, I think we have some of the greatest people in the world, in our uh, chat room, and on our media. Um, so check out other shows and join us in chat. Okay, where am I going to next? I've been wanting to talk about this for so long. It's old news now. 
but I might as well get to it. I wanted to talk about, uh, and I probably did talk about, my wife was telling me today when she asked me, what are you going to talk about today? And I was kind of telling her, and I said something about, um, hey, Rob works. You're absolutely right. Apache web servers are the most popular web server out there. That's absolutely correct. More popular than Microsoft servers. Anyway, uh, so I was telling my wife, oh, I'm probably going to talk about human trafficking, uh, you know, and Linux and about all bleeding eventually stops. And she goes, are you talking about human trafficking again? I was like, well, I said, I never really got to this article that I wanted to get to. And um, so it's in my lineup today. Let me see what, if there's something else more fun to talk about. Uh, no. Yeah, they're all about the same. Uh, the main thing I wanted to cover is uh, weeks ago now. Let's see. This was March 9th. Okay, a month ago. Uh, the Department of Health and Human Services were calling, were calling for volunteers to go down and help at the border. And I was thinking to myself, are you kidding me? Number one, I mean... If you created this, whatever you want to call it, uh, surge, crisis, normal flow, I don't care what you call it. But if you created it, you should be prepared to deal with it with something other than volunteers. I mean, Christ, do you think you can print money up by the trillions and give it to other countries for Christ's sakes? I think you could hire some people to manage things at the border if that's your thing. But it really did kind of drive me crazy to ask for volunteers for something as critical as what's going on at the border. And I don't care one way or the other. Um, one thing I care about and I think is pretty serious is how we, we how the federal government of the United States is responsible, and I think directly responsible, and I hope at some point, I hope at some point that people who are coming into this country from other countries, when they realize that the abuse, um, sexual and physical abuse, that they put up with to get here was pretty much, I won't say directly the federal government's responsibility because I think people are responsible for themselves and they need to make, you know, they need to make their own decisions and be ready to take care of themselves. I help out where I can, you know, I help people, but still you got to make decisions for yourself. But when we tell people when we when the federal government tells young people i guess that's anybody under 18 that we're not going to turn you away if you come to the border and then that kind of encourages people to come seeking a better life in the united states but you know unfortunately you're probably going to be raped or beaten or enslaved along the way or mistreated uh, you know, how many people were in that were in that SUV that got in a crash there and it killed like 15 people? And it was, uh, what was that? That was that big Ford excursion, I think. And it had like 27 people in it. I mean, how, I, okay, that's a big rig. But how do you pack 27 people in a rig like that? I mean, that's kind of abuse in my opinion. But what I was saying is I hope somebody gets to the point where after a few years they've been here, they start suing the federal government for the stuff that they had to go through, not only after they got here into the United States and lived in those conditions. Those conditions are appalling. Um, I, I can't imagine being a human being, being a, a, a mother or father or brother or sister, and seeing people treated that way, packed like sardines in these, whatever you want to call them. I'm not going to play the emotional name game about whether it's a cage or a pod or a welcoming facility. 
I, it doesn't matter what you call it. I mean, it, just look at the facts. They're packed in like sardines. You know, in the middle of a of a so-called pandemic that's going to kill so many millions of people, but yet we pack these people in like sardines and treat them like, I mean, I don't know what they're eating or what they're drinking. I noticed that some farmers, ranchers, have said online that they find bodies on their properties down along the border. Um people trying to come to this country. I mean, it's hot and dry. It's a long, you know, it's not like walking to the local grocery store. Those people travel miles and miles in the heat and dry desert. (laughs) And, you know, with not like a whole lot of water stops along the way. I mean, I hope there's water along the way, but hell, it's a desert. It's not like there's water every couple hundred feet or not like you're following the river up to, United States, I guess you have to cross one or two to get here, or, you know, there's a few different places to cross, but, you know, it's brutal, and it doesn't have to happen, you know, and I hate it when politicians use children as their reason for doing something. Because you can pretty much tell that they, politicians, don't give a crap about children. Literally don't give two cents about children. What politicians want are grown-ups that will support them one way or the other, financially, physically, you know, whatever vote for them. But they don't want the only way to get those people in vast numbers and especially people that they think they can manipulate mentally is to get them here young and uh, you know, try and manipulate them from day one. But I, you know, like I was saying, I don't know how you can be a compassionate human being, whether you're a mother or father or whatever. I don't know how you can be a compassionate human being. And I know that they know what is going on to those children along the way before they get to the United States. How can you do that with a clear conscience? How can you allow those children to start a trip like that, thinking that life is going to be so much better when they get to the United States, but the price they have to pay along the way is a serious, heavy price indeed. It's abuse. It's violence. Of course, I've said before on previous shows, when, you know, I hate to bring this up every week, but it's just such a perfect example, is now we're legalizing prostitution when two years ago, I swear to God, a year ago, that kind of activity was supposedly humiliating and degrading to women and men, but now all of a sudden we are going to make it legal for whatever reason. I'm telling you. It it's crazy to me. It's it's I. You can only understand it by trying to understand politics, and I'm really not willing, I guess, too much to uh, try and understand those people. What I see and the actions I see those people do, I know that. Um, They have ulterior motives, and they don't really care about human beings. Um, Anyway, that's going to wrap it up for this week. Man, I talked for a heck of a lot longer than I thought I was going to talk about on those couple of topics. But I hope you guys have a great week. Really, anybody listening, anybody kind of checking into the show, go to Real Liberty Media. Check out some of the other great shows on there. Uh, Get in the chat room, chat with people. Find out about Linux and check that out. And remember, all bleeding eventually stops. See you guys next week. Thank you. 